According to the Cambridge Dictionary, a hallucination is when you see, hear, feel, or smell something which does not exist. And because they don't exist, modern psychiatry views them as the meaningless malfunction of a broken brain, a dangerous occurrence which can and should be stopped with medication. And at first glance, this makes perfect sense, because if you're seeing things that absolutely nobody else can see, well then chances are you've probably got a fairly serious mental illness. At least that's what I thought until I had a few hallucinations of my own. Back in my own bipolar awakening 13 years ago, I was literally wandering through a shopping mall somewhat pointlessly when I started to hear the music The Wanderer playing on the speakers in the mall. Or was that music in my head? To this day, I don't know. And then a few days later, while laying on the carpet in a hotel ballroom, I was staring at a chandelier of white lights, and a light in the middle of the chandelier turned pink. Now that, I'm sure, was a hallucination. But to me, these were hardly the signs of mental illness. I mean, I was wandering through a shopping mall, and then the music playing was The Wanderer. It sort of gave meaning to the whole experience. And then that light turning pink, I took clearly as a message from God that part of my bipolar awakening had ended, and that somehow I was receiving a gift of love. Now what I didn't know back then was that this kind of experience is quite common for bipolar people, having rather subtle, almost friendly hallucinations that seem to be giving you spiritual messages. Sometimes they can be just reassuring, like hearing the voice of God or Jesus, or maybe even a dead relative saying, I love you. But the messages can also be very unique and specific, like one girl I know heard a group of Vikings singing happy birthday to her, letting her know that she was being reborn. Audible hallucinations, or voices, can also give advice on how to run your life. For example, one girl was told to get her house in order. And then other voices can be very specific and pragmatic, like continue to take your medications for now, that's what one person was told. And another was told to simply go back inside the house because being outside was too dangerous. Visual hallucinations can also provide the same sort of reassuring or counseling messages. And often these messages are carried by spiritual figures like angels, saints, or Jesus. But the messengers can also be quite symbolic as well. While getting a massage, my niece had a hallucination or vision of a conch floating in front of her. And then only later did she find out that the masseuse actually worshipped Yamanja, the Brazilian goddess of the sea. So while they may not exist for everybody else, the voices and visions which psychiatry dismisses as mere hallucinations can have meaning for us that we may find truly inspiring. Now, if you'll remember from my last video on paranoia, sometimes hallucinations come with not such a friendly face. And as opposed to being inspiring, often they simply scare the crap out of people. And in fact, especially the audible hallucinations that are most often associated with schizophrenia, the messages can be quite destructive, telling people that they should kill themselves or maybe kill other people like their parents. Another usually disturbing type of hallucination is when somebody sees the face of one person transform or morph into the face of someone else. And it's when I first came across this morphing phenomenon that I started to understand the meaning of these disturbing hallucinations. Because one guy we were working with last year started to see the face of his dead ex-girlfriend who had committed suicide in the face of his current girlfriend. Then later, in the depths of his bipolar psychosis, he was having extended conversations with the spirit of this girl telling her that it was time for her to leave him. And that's when I began to realize that disturbing hallucinations were often connected to traumatic experiences. Basically, when we have an unresolved traumatic issue, this issue will stay with us in our body as a kind of trapped energy. Eckhart Tolle has referred to this as the pain body. Now, every single one of us is carrying around some level of trapped traumatic energy in this pain body of ours. However, if the healing and releasing of this trauma is absolutely critical to the health of your soul, then the traumatic energy will create a hallucination, usually in the form of a voice or an image, that will force you to recognize its existence. And in this way, a hallucination can be seen as simply a strong dream of the utmost importance. It's a message of your soul that demands to be heard. 
And so if it demands to be heard, why does it appear to be scary or evil? Well, just like a dream that turns into a nightmare, this image is a manifestation of your own fear. And the more fearful you are of re-experiencing any particular trauma in your life, the scarier the hallucination will be. Dr. John Weir Perry was the first psychiatrist I came across which described the connection between buried trauma and hallucinations. R.D. Lang linked schizophrenia to childhood trauma back in the 1960s. And more recently, Dr. Rufus May, a former schizophrenic himself, has become somewhat famous through the documentary The Doctor Who Hears Voices, championing the idea that through therapy, audible hallucinations can be healed if you just pay careful attention to what they have to say. And although I hadn't looked into the formal research from the thousands of messages I've received over the past two years, I had come to expect that people who were experiencing strong and fearful hallucinations were very often coming from very difficult family upbringings, often involving physical abuse and or sex abuse. And in fact, some doctors are starting to confirm this hypothesis. In 2006, PsychCentral.com reported that 13 different research studies have verified that between 51% and 97% of people suffering from schizophrenia have been physically or sexually abused. In New Zealand, one study has found that 17 of 22 patients who were abused in childhood had hallucinations, delusions, and or thought disorders, the primary symptoms of schizophrenia. And finally, at nonprofit organization Intervoice, which also believes in listening to the voices of audible hallucinations, they found that 75% of adults and 85% of children had voices which could be directly linked back to specific traumas in their lives. So, rather than looking at hallucinations as meaningless because they're not real, we need to start seeing them as special messengers from our souls. Messengers that are trying to help us heal. Sometimes they speak to us in gentle, reassuring ways, providing inspiration and guidance. Other times they torment us for ignoring our deepest feelings. Either way, if we ever hope to heal, we need to start listening to these messengers, paying close attention to what they have to say. And what can help you do this is to remember, first, the hallucination can never harm you. It's not a physical threat. It's a projection from you that needs to be interpreted symbolically, not concretely. Second, the dark or evil hallucinations are not here to kill the real you, but they may want to kill your ego. And sometimes it's hard to tell the difference. That's why it requires real courage to engage these spiritual forces. But once you do, then, just like all aspects of psychosis, the key to healing your hallucinations is to surrender to them. So instead of medicating yourself or praying that they're going to go away, you might want to just go to them before they come to you. To do this, you can simply lay down on your bed, get very quiet, and invite them into your life. Then, once you have their attention, you might want to start talking to them. And for one, you could ask them, well, what are you doing here? Remember, these dark energies are only feeding on your fear. So if you can find the courage to simply open yourself up to them, the love which springs from your openness will make them leave. And by the way, if you do find this idea too scary, have someone stay with you for support. It's always easier to do this sort of thing with somebody else's help. Now for some people, when these energies leave our pain bodies, it can feel like a real exorcism. This is what one of my friends at New Light Beings had to say when her demons left her. I used to see black shadows of monsters everywhere, but when the demons left, so did the visual hallucinations, the worst ones. It felt so pure when they were sucked out of my body. It was like all the filth in the world lived deep down in my soul, and it was forcefully and powerfully sucked out. Everything looked brighter, happier, crystal clear. I was a baby. And finally, if you're looking to develop the courage to deal with your inner demons, you might want to take a look at Dr. Carl Jung's The Red Book. Back when Jung was a practicing psychiatrist, he started to suffer from schizophrenia himself. But instead of turning to psychiatric treatment, he began to write a diary in which he documented the intimate conversations he had with the different entities he would find in his own mind. The book also contains many images that Jung painted in order to help him integrate these buried parts of himself. Although he considered the book his finest work, 
He never published it, knowing that the world was not ready for what he had to say. However, almost 50 years after his death, the book is finally being published this year and promises to be one of the most influential books of our times. So it certainly seems that when it comes to the spiritual realms of our own soul, the world is finally waking up.